So, I'd like to welcome you to our MSE during this week. Um, unfortunately, Professor Zu cannot be here today to talk about how to give a presentation because he's on a very important business trip. Instead, we will be having a talk on remote labs held by Herrn Andre Ich, and we are very looking forward to it. And I will maximize the window now, and then you can basically start with your presentation. So, uh, hello, and a very warm welcome. Um, uh, Sebastian told me that uh, the scope of the uh, the talk will be about remote labs, but that we should, or I should also include some uh, our previous work. Uh, so we will start with a prehistory where we started to develop and uh, remote labs, uh, basically. Uh, yeah, some time ago, some years ago, uh, starting in Magdeburg. And then what problems did we had? What evolved out, evolved out of these problems? Uh, what have we have developed? So I will talk uh, shortly about LeaScript, uh, how we can implement classrooms, and then afterwards uh, the stuff that we have learned so far by implementing uh, or by developing LeaScript and peer-to-peer -peer systems that we included into the classrooms or the classrooms functionality. We then now finally also will get back to this. Uh, use the same technology uh, as I will show you that you can use then afterwards also to build any kind of remote labs. So this is the idea. So I can share my slide, but probably you, we are not all in the same chat, right? So if someone is interested in, I could probably just, uh, 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 oh. you can make right. a... It's too small. Maybe it's too small. So all of you should now have the same <laughs> right? Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Some years ago, uh, we were involved in the uh, so-called industrial ELAP project. Uh, you can run also the same uh, basically video in your slides uh, if you want to and the scope was or the task was to connect those tiny little robots uh, made with Arduino or Arduino platforms uh, to the web so that students can actually 24 7 access and program uh, these tiny little robots so this was a yeah a group project uh, with some other institutions also with some pedagogy uh, and uh, didactics and stuff like this. This is the former uh, younger version of Sebastian. So they are discussing about this remote lab. And then we had this, so this was the initial uh, initial beginning that we had. So uh, access the hardware and then was the task to deliver somehow this educational content. And we started to, the easiest way actually to deliver this content or to enable multiple co-authors uh, to develop different tasks uh, on the same yeah, platform actually was marked down. So this was our starting point. And so we started to develop those courses in Markdown, as you can see it here is the visualization. On the other side, you can see this, uh, the visualization of the older lab. So we also could uh, actually program, upload your code uh, to different robots and execute or yeah, fulfill different or solve different uh, problems and tasks. So basically, the idea was we had one lab that was a fixed, uh, how to say, yeah, a fixed uh, uh, lab uh, situation, configuration, whatever you want to. And the only thing that we actually, or what we learned from this is that we want to have modularity in pieces of uh, how we deliver this educational content. So we do this practically or basically with this additional, uh, yeah, markdown course development. And then the idea was actually born uh, to uh, probably markdown is not enough. Uh, why don't we add the functionality to insert quizzes or something like this? Why not, if we already can do uh, 
their code highlighting, zip text highlighting, and markdown, why not directly make this stuff also executable? And so the idea was actually the first thing that we was born from this original industrial uh, industrial elip was to make this educational content more engaging, more interactive, and more because of that it could be solved for the uh, solve for diff yeah served and. Uh, yeah, to solve different problems for different purposes and I can show it to you probably which looks like this so if we created some kind of course I don't know if you have seen this from Sebastian Zuck in, in his presentations so this is like the online editor of Leah script and uh, so this is the base idea uh, so how we now actually uh, was the first step how we deliver or create educational content. So back in the days, our background technologies were basically Elixir, uh, which is a language that compiles to the Erlang virtual machine. It's quite interesting because it's functional programming and with kind of, uh, you can de yeah, develop back-end systems that actually don't crash and if they don't and if they crash uh, they actually restart uh, you have different uh, things for monitoring and uh, functionality so you can actually create or develop bulletproof uh, back-end uh, systems if you want to so there's a nice feature and for the front end we chose L because it's also a functional language but in this case it's not that you can actually try out uh, different programming tasks or so different ways um, the compiler forces you so if you have a switch and case uh, statement probably it's also you no know, uh, you have to solve their additional cases and you have to uh, take care of them otherwise I won't compile it they have a built-in uh, also type system that's very rigid and but the, the thing is it might be hard uh, for the beginning uh, to get into this functional programming style uh, stuff but afterwards it's actually uh, it helps you actually once your program gets compiled it actually works so you don't have to uh, you don't have such problems with null pointers or stuff like this so and then if we leave the laboratory out for a moment and just focus on the front end and uh, create creation of educational content then we actually found out that there's a browser already uh, has a lot of features uh, that can be used actually so that we uh, don't need a back-end system anymore so the next part is that we actually eliminated this Elixir back-end and we use the browser-based uh, technologies that are already in there something like uh, IndexedDB every uh, your browser has a built-in database uh, that can be used probably most of the browsers, not all, have a, a speech a synthesis API, which actually yeah, generate text-to-speech. And how this might sound like on Firefox. Hello and welcome, this is a text-to-speech example. If you do this on uh, Chrome, it will be better. If you do this uh, on different on your Android phone, the sound and text output will be much better. And you have this uh, support for multiple languages. The other thing is that there's, if you develop now a web app or something like this, you can do this as a progressive web app, which means actually your website is installable. Uh, you can take over the control of those caches, meaning if you're if the internet is somehow broken, uh, you cannot connect to the internet or something like this, your website will still work, even if you are offline. And also all the content that you have loaded uh, once, it's also accessible. And the other thing we are now uh, using a lot is this called WebRTC. Uh, it's a web real-time communication. And there, uh, the basis is, so we don't want to rely on servers anymore or on centralized architectures because like from our previous examples um, the lab is not uh, yeah to say it's not alive anymore it's not used anymore it's not developed anymore and so we hope if we turn to those uh, browser-based peer-to-peer uh, -peer technologies uh, like WebRTC which allows us to uh, create an entire connection between browsers uh, we can create more stable and more scalable uh, solutions for the problems that we have but the problem with web RTC is if you have a peer-to-peer -peer system or that you're using with the browser and you don't have something like a central authority how can you uh, 
guarantee or make actually give, give some guarantees. So there's this new technology. It's called conflict-free replicated data types. Also interesting to look at. So these are mathematically proven data types that will sync uh, or sync or eventually result in the same uh, state. Uh, no matter if some data might be lost during the trans uh, during transfer synchronization or if some package arrive uh, two times or three times and stuff like this, it's actually guaranteed that all the peers will end up with the same state. So these are basically the building blocks uh, that we are used. And if you, uh, and for the course or content creation actually that we used to, and we have developed this uh, extension for Markdown that can be used basically for anything and can be extended uh, also. And uh, shortly we'll show you some of the features. So if you take this idea, like uh, Markdown is the basics, everyone uh, can learn this stuff or quite easily, but there are some uh, features actually missing or we missed uh, a lot of them because Markdown is made for static content and we wanted to have something more engaging, uh, dynamical uh, content, something reusable where students can uh, try different uh, stuff out or experiment uh, also with their course content in this case. So for our didactics team, back in the days, uh, we created the opportunity for quizzes. Uh, the syntax looks quite easy. So if you have something like a text input field and the solution should be uh, Leah script. So this is basically just a, this is an animation step. And so what is the name of the markdown dialect, dialect I'm, I'm talking about? So it might be what it's called pure script. Uh, let's check that. No, it's obviously not the correct answer. So what was the correct answer? Leo script. So this is basically uh, a simple example uh, how, how you can use or reuse. If you're aware of these patterns, uh, da to square brackets, this will always generate something like a text input. If we go uh, further, you know this probably. We can also combine this with ASCII art, like drawings with uh, text, in this case, where we simply input our text inputs. And this was an example from the Anton app that I recreated, probably with Leah script. So it's basically, this is something fancy for using drawing or ASCII art drawing, which is quite simple. And the other ones are input fields so that your, yeah, first graders probably have to solve some uh, math problems in it. So. Yeah, the answer is resolved. And there are other patterns, probably, if you want to have something like uh, uh, radio buttons, uh, do you know of an easier uh, way to create quizzes, uh, probably? So you can always, if you have something like yes, oh, that's probably the wrong answer, no. Uh, or if I want to have something like, in contrast to radio buttons, I want to use those check buttons where you can have these multiple uh, multiple choice quiz probably that you can generate and uh, simply uh, recompile this uh, go back to the one and now you have different solutions where you can uh, click or select multiple of them and if you in the same case are aware of this pattern you can combine this also with a something like a matrix and this can be solved by everything by yourself so how difficult it might be to learn german Actually, if you, uh, what are the appropriate articles, probably for yogurt or paprika. Uh, so, yeah, could be the easiest way, but you can try this uh, out for your own. So this is just an easy way. The other way that we actually uh, wanted to have is something like multimedia or more elaborate multimedia features, uh, which is, yeah, with a markdown syntax, I simply added some links to images from Leonardo da Vinci. And so it's nothing fancy uh, actually, uh, but if we combine them into a, an abstract or paragraph that contains or consists of multiple images uh, probably, so there is no space in between. Uh, if I do the same, I get something like, an, uh, like a gallery. This can be also used or reused with multiple 
You can do this with video, with audio, and afterwards with simulations and coding uh, examples as well, as we'll show you to you. And the combination of the text-to-speech output uh, I've listed in here in a video. So basically, the idea is that you can create or run the educational content. We create it once, and you can either read this as a textbook, you can add your animation stuff, and to have it in a presentation as I'm using it in here, uh, or, or slides with some additional uh, content uh, actually added. So the idea, you have some animation step, and then you add the explanation. So you can repeat this actually. I uh, cannot turn it into full mode in this case. Hi, I am a Markdown document that can be so, presented in textbook mode. As you see, there's a as notation. Or as an interactive presentation. Change the presentation mode and check out what happens. Any markdown block can be prefixed with two braces that contain a number to define when this block should appear in the presentation. In contrast, the following table will only be visible at step two. And of course, you can also translate your content probably to German. We are in total control of what happens on this side, actually, uh, on the coding side, and also how it's presented. And then we can tell this also, or give it to some uh, translation services like Google Translator, in this case, which translates the site and also uh, adds new voices. In jedem Markdown block können Hallo, ich bin ein Markdown Dokument das in Lehrbuchmodus als Folien oder als interaktive Präsentation präsentiert werden kann. Ändern Sie den Präsentationsmodus Animations Schritt 3. So, just the idea is pretty basic or straightforward. You can repeat this uh, on your uh, laptops. And then another feature is like visualization or dynamic visualization. So in this case, in most of the cases for our labs or measurements, we simply need it. Uh, we simply needed a way to simply draw some uh, yeah, signal lines, uh, some uh, curves, values, and this. And for this, we also implemented some kind of ASCII art uh, syntax. And then the basic idea was actually, you know, it actually represents some kind of points. You can add additional uh, features, like if you want to have something like a uh, red dot row in here, and it probably might look like this. And so these are basically data points. And if we are talking about tables, which are also data points, actually, why not automatically also visualize them? There might be some measurements from, an, uh, yeah, it might be from uh, running measurements um, from a simulation uh, or whatever. And so the idea was actually born so that the data within Markdown table is also analyzed uh, according to uh, different yeah, requirements uh, and needs. And if there is a way to visualize this data, it actually uh, you get those visualization for free, like in this case, line plot. Or how would you probably uh, visualize something like this? Uh, like in this case, there are no X values in here. Probably the correct way uh, would be a bar chart. So and you can, if you want to, you can uh, try around, uh, sort, explore uh, the data, and you will generate different kinds of visualizations. So actually, this is for quite simple uh, task. Or if you have something like this, where you remove those, you have those values that are practically not visible, uh, like uh, uh, the kilograms are too small according to the lifespan and the mitigant. Uh, value if I reload this. So it actually the easiest way where I can plot these values might be a radar plot. So just as another example. And of course, if there are more complex values, you can also force it to use it as a heat map or something else. So basically, there's one interactive document that you can use for data visualization, experimenting in any kinds and of values.
So uh, the other uh, thing that we actually wanted to have or actually embed is something like uh, embedding content simulations from different uh, websites. And from time to time, either as an iframe or there's this uh, service called OEmbed. So which is basically an extension of the markdown syntax for a link where we actually only added this question mark, question mark, uh, which means whatever the content is, try to embed this. Uh, tells the Leo script interpreter. So in this case, this would be uh, a 3D uh, model of the Familienschacht. It takes some time to load. You should be also able to repeat this in your uh, presentation. So loading still takes the time. Let's skip over to the next one. So there is a circuit simulation that you can basically uh, embed. So my system is a bit. So it's just a combination of any kind of 3D imaging, a circuit simulation, or if you want to have something like a physics or chemistry simulation. I don't know what it does at the moment. I heat this up. So it's probably from the idea from those remote labs was born to have these more um, entertaining uh, online courses that can be generated in various ways. So this is just uh, one thing. And then there was the need for, I call it coding and re uh, reusability, because uh, we from, yeah, teach most of the time, like programming. And uh, actually, we don't want to implement functionality features again and again and again. And so there is one way we create some kind of library extensions for Markdown. If you click onto this link, uh, and you want to experiment with different uh, features or things that can be embedded, actually. Something like this ABC notation, which might be programming too, another case. So the idea is this Markdown documents contain some kind of functionality that I would like to reuse uh, in my course. So the only thing that I have to do is basically to import this stuff in my, into my document header. And where's an example? So this is basically the markdown notation for uh, adding a code block. So three back ticks. So we compile this so it's nothing fancy. It's actually renders some kind of those music notation. But I can now also uh, execute this. So in this case, it generates some kind of music. Which, uh, with which uh, the students can actually interact. The notes somehow changed. I can increase this. Hmm. So, makes sense. so it's basically one way of doing programming or extending those uh, courses and features. But uh, like Sebastian or Professor Zuck is using it most of the time. So there is an IVR simulation probably that we can use and which is actually basically the same. So we add some kind of code block and there below we simply attach a script or something that tells uh, the, the system what to do with the code block. So we're starting a simulation and there are some kind of uh, timers that are this shown. So the simulation. So you can connect this with buttons, uh, with other stuff. It's basically generated in the same way as the music simulation. So if you're interested in creating some uh, content and about 
hosting the stuff. So one thing, actually, we are coming from the programming side. I will uh, just show to introduce it. One thing is to use Git, where you can develop your courses, your educational contents, just for free and host this for free. Uh, basically, what I encourage you to try out probably is like something like IPFS, the Interplanetary File System, or the IPNS. It's basically like a distributed um, a Dropbox uh, where hashing is done yeah, from peers, or you don't root about file names, stuff like this, you root about uh, through hashes. And so the same file always gets the same hash and it can be distributed to multiple no nodes. And this is kind of a neat way uh, to generate or to publish content actually. So, or as we have shown this, you can use also the Tor network uh, to share this educational content uh, for Leo scripts or if you want to do also, you can use the exporter uh, to export the stuff to a SCORM package that can be uploaded uh, into your LMS. Uh, like it's shown in this video, you can run an Android app. Where it's basically, uh, this is just a demo of how to use this in Moodle, but it also now works in Opal. You can uh, have different output formats, Android APK, as I said, and that's basically uh, it. So this was the starting idea from the those labs uh, we went to the uh, stage of creating more engaging educational content that can be hosted for free and then we actually wanted uh, needed uh, something to add some kind of classroom functionality uh, back into, into the system again and this is also uh, the technology that we are using now in our, in our labs probably I can Wait a second. So before this, uh, everything that we did was actually developing like a client server application. So there is a server which probably uh, resembles or uh, controls your laboratory infrastructure. And there are multiple uh, users that can connect actually. And if you, and this is some kind of, if you think of the internet as a distributed system, and this is a, some how the worst, uh, I said, yeah, worst architecture that we can come up with this uh, single responsibility failure. So if the server is down, probably everything is down, it crashes. Another way to solve this problem is by using peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks and your browsers already facilitate this kind of functionality, which is called peer-to-peer, -peer, which means so you have done a single server, but this connection uh, is spread across multiple connected users or nodes, which might be data, which might be some kind of interaction, some measurements, or in our case, the, those uh, laboratory infrastructure, or the LearScript uh, classroom. And so the technology that we are using for this, as I mentioned, was to use a WebRTC, or which is called uh, Web Real-Time Communication which basically, which you're using most of the time if you're doing some video conferencing via the browser and you don't, if the server where you connect to is actually somewhere in uh, California, it's actually the worst idea if you're both sitting in the same building to send all your video streams to California and uh, so that the other opponent receives it back into the, to this call. WebRTC somehow allows you to figure out a direct connection between your browsers and then uh, directly share whatever you want to, some multimedia content or data, uh, which might be, but it's a bit more uh, difficult actually. So what you basically need is something like a central meeting point, uh, which is called a signaling server, but this is just like, it's a meeting point where you exchange your uh, information, your offer, actually where you are want to attend into within this group or within this chat or something like this. So there you just think, think of a unique idea where Alice wants to get in contact within a group chat uh, with a certain idea. It sends this uh, to a signaling server and to probably uh, tell Bob or so that it, so to get the first connection actually to Bob, then there's this thing called 
uh, what is mostly uh, added to is those uh, stun servers, which you don't have to be aware, but basically they are figure out uh, each opponent. Uh, so what is their, might be the public IP uh, from different servers, and this is sent back and forth so that they can probably from one connection find each other. And the same thing is done <coughs> if you send multimedia uh, content. So this is my webcam configuration. Uh, these are my, uh, as called formats, uh, actually, or sizes uh, I can send to which one does your browser understands or which codecs and stuff like this. So then the communication gets uh, back and forth. And if everything works well, they establish a direct communication between those browsers. So, and if it doesn't turn out uh, to go that well, uh, because there are some, yeah, firewalls uh, that don't allow the access to uh, between those browsers or stop some kind of communication. You directly you have to have something in the background, like it's called a churn server. And then your peer-to-peer -peer system, again, becomes a centralized system because everything goes through this churn server, but the churn server is not actually not aware of what is handling. So the communication is secured. It's also encrypted. So it's just like a relay server for security or for safety purposes. And if you are more interested in WebRTC, so there is a nice uh, video uh, that explains it's quite difficult actually uh, to understand. And so um, if you did not understand it at this moment, uh, it's probably, uh, yeah, it's my fault. I could not explain it quite well, but I'm not the only one who struggles to explain WebRTC. And then, as I mentioned before, we have this P2P system where, where data that is transmitted might be lost in this case. So the, uh, how could you guarantee, for example, also if you're uh, connecting to a laboratory uh, where, where some measurements might be uh, crucial, how you guarantee that all end up all all connected user have the same view on the system or end up with the same view on the system. And for this purpose, you can think of or use those uh, CRDTs or conflict free replicated data types. And the idea is actually quite simple. So, okay, I'll leave this for the moment. And uh, the task for you, you might be probably how to implement a distributed counter. So if you have Alice and Bob and someone else and you simply want when one clicks on a button or adds like in this case five so the distributed counter value is now five so the state might be sent to ls in this case ls adds to this value one and if the connection is well and everyone receives uh, these states so uh, it works quite well but you see this information or this uh, is lost so bob still thinks my counter is five, I include or add uh, two to it and send this to Alice. And uh, as you can see, he was not aware actually uh, of that there was one added. So uh, we have a discrepancy in this case. So um, it's quite difficult to uh, yeah solve this, but one solution might be, or the easiest, uh, instead of a single value, that would be to use something like sets and unions. So where everyone just adds his own ID together with his own counter value. So Bob starts with zero, Alice starts with zero, Bob increases by five, transmits. So now the set is actually, so if we think of, we can transfer the state or the set uh, or the result actually. So Alice is still with state five, uh, Bob with, uh, with zero, bought by five, and if someone wants to calculate the counter value, it's actually adding all those pieces together. So Alice is in control of her counter, increments this, this information is actually lost. Bob is not aware of Alice, so for him, everything is still uh, increased by two, result to seven. So he sends this up, so, and they are still, even, even Bob is not aware of Alice state so far, Alice will calculate or come to the right conclusion. And if one submission works quite good, actually, or from Alice's part, they will end up in the same state. So just a simple idea uh, how to secure this consistency in the distributed network. And this gets even complicated, more complicated, if you think of 
text uh, that's edited uh, by multiple persons at the same time. And so different ideas for CRDTs. Blah, blah. So there are different implementations, blah, blah, blah. And now, and this was one thing that we probably also used in this classroom feature from Leah's script. So, and I encourage you, if you have opened the slide already, simply go to the share button, like share, enter classroom. Where is it? Select gun. So actually, so the idea is that we can use different uh, backends or peer-to-peer -peer, uh, solutions to create or to use this, either connect via WebRTC or something else and uh, connect or create something like a shared state by using these CRDTs. So click on the gun and you can now enter something like, so we should, shall end up all in the same room, like Frey, uh, Berg, I connect to this, you can see the URL has changed, if you're interested in. You can also... I think there's still... Uh, the URL should actually have been changed, if you want to take a picture. Um, and if you have opened this... Oh, there are already three within uh, enter the classroom. So you can have those chat now, for example, like I oh, control. I hope everything works. Or oh, if I screwed up, actually, hi, oh, I received the message. So if you go to the next slide, so there's uh, like the idea that we call like um, classroom light is here if you do this how is this language called probably you can all answer now this quiz now, of course i will type into the script uh, check it um, okay. there are two persons that got it right on the first trial you see and uh, it's possibly so the idea is i add my data into the classroom and is it possible to communicate with browser Check yes, uh, there are two who did it. Uh, there's a third one who clicked on resolved onto the resolve button. So I am not aware of who is doing this actually, but it's just like an anonymous state. And if you leave this room, also you take your data with you uh, and out. And so we get back if one who resolved it probably leaves the room, we end up with 100% and two. In this case, ah, there's already someone trying out. So on this slide, you can use something like an extension <clears throat> that we also use within the labs. So you can do those questions. How do you like this approach so far? It's okay. Submit it. I'm the only one. And you can actually share your feelings or something like this, which uses also the back end system that we are using here. And one benefit of using Leo script is that you basically can will understand any kind within the chat. And this Leah script syntax, if I transmit this, uh, I should remove the animation step. Wait a second. So you all have the same, yeah, table in this case, or animation, or you can, Upload or send directly those. Where is it? Well, let's copy this one. So those video stuff in this case. So this is just like the basic technology, browser-based, that we are using as a backend within a system and now to get back to those remote labs, uh, what we have done now has actually been uh, some part of co-developing. There's a project called Idris, which basically allows you to share, uh, to offer browser-based browser -based classrooms 
probably similar to Leo script, but differently because it uses a centralized server uh, for connecting those students, different students, but only from their browsers. But what you can also do is you can run a browser or open a link in a, a station mode, which allows you to connect uh, to probably some kind of local hardware. And the state from within this station browsers actually uh, can be shared into this back into this classroom. So you see there's this one central application. And what we did now was actually something like, yes, we built this and use this stuff that we learned from Leo script with our P2P systems, web RTC synchronizing uh, with uh, CRDTs. And uh, let's try it out. Basically, actually, it should work in the same way. So um, what we uh, develop now is this thing called uh, Leo script or address light. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's hosted uh, on GitHub. I run some, already have some experiments and I can show to you if you create a new classroom it's basically you will if you open this link you won't see the same thing because uh, those experiments are stored within my browser within my uh, local database I create them and I share them with everyone uh, who I invite to so if I create a new classroom probably so this is my new classroom uh, rename it to the I back save it I want to add some we can add some modules probably so the idea is that you build a lab out of a different lab, uh, lab modules this could be an editor this could be a video stream this could be a terminal server this could be a module that is still not developed so we can just have a look at uh, at our module solution and the easiest would probably could be done the first was to use this terminal server if I want to share access to my local uh, Linux installation so there's some code uh, that's not interesting at the moment the only thing that you have to do is just like I want to load this module so which means I have to input this URL so this is just like a simple website um, or it could be actually just a file uh, which is copied uh, add this to so I now have a terminal server and this terminal server uh, should appear in station mode so say this reference module I want to have it there's at the moment there's just this room called lobby so and I want to leave it in there so it should be only visible in the lobby it's not in so I could now switch to those station mode and as you can see probably I don't know here's this classroom UL and you get this uh, large ID so this is the way where my browser actually tries to connect uh, with your browsers and share the configuration of the file or uh, the, the yeah or share uh, the data when I'm in station mode and I do the same if I open the browser in the station mode probably it's not called classroom uh, it's called station in this case and there is this uh, already run some kind of uh, address in the background. Wait a second. Teachers and students can yeah. So there's something running. Nothing fancy. I can see. Okay, there is a station mode running. I will close this for the moment. If I go back to those, I can share it to you. So there is now, I created a new configuration, which is basically some modules. In this case, just one module. And I want to save this uh, for later. I can open, so there's nothing fancy. There are just two modules. There's reference modules with a lack of uh, configuration and this uh, PyTerm module. So nothing fancy, but, and I added this, 
uh, also to the Freiberg. So this is a more complicated configuration, which might be some kind of uh, metadata. We add some kind of uh, markdown uh, module, which does some kind of explanation. I add some an editor, probably, which comes uh, with some coding and stuff like this. So this is just like a downloaded configuration with much more modules. And if I want to share this, I also only have to get to the raw URL where the text file is. I restore this from URL, not from a locally saved file. Just I tell also my browser to connect or to get to this website or course configuration to uh, grab it, fetch it, parse it, and use, use this as my uh, module. So it has changed. I save this. So in the lobby. So as you can see, there are probably some kind of more modules now embedded with their own configuration, visualization, stuff like this. Uh, there's a streaming uh, portion where I can share my video if this is now working. So this is saved actually. And if I want to save, uh, share this video, I will share, just share this with you in a few seconds. But uh, let's add, I added in, I also reload this in a station mode. So this is the kind of lobby it takes some time. I'm, ah, don't. So wait again. Uh, probably I got the wrong camera. Wait a second. There's way too much cameras. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, better load this from uh, Chrome. Okay, uh, let's switch on. Wait a second, wait a second. Oh, always in Firefox, I have problems with my local cameras. So this is another browser. It's actually not connected to this uh, to this browser. And what I've saved in here, stored in here. Uh, so I load this now as a station, or I use this uh, Chrome browser now in station mode. What it does, it tries to connect via the internet uh, to those other uh, entities, grabs, gets this configuration and tries to access this peer-to-peer -peer mode. So it takes some seconds and you see the station actually appears. So uh, probably, I, I think there are too many cameras. Okay, probably as a, maybe I cannot share uh, the camera uh, at the moment uh, because of uh, because there's another camera connected. So actually, uh, what I did also was to add this Arduino, and if this user now probably you now switch to the station, those states get synchronized. As you can see, camera is not working uh, in my case. Can we load this? I think you have to disconnect from the big blue button session. Yeah, probably. So, uh, oh, as, we cannot see you, your camera at the moment. <laughs> but you can see, but you can see the both screens at the moment, right? Yeah, of course. But um, we maximized your screen sharing, so we cannot see your your camera at the moment. So you could theoretically disconnect uh, the, 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 the camera. Camera Maybe. should actually be in here. So, but at the moment, yeah. But at this part, it's nothing fancy. Actually, it should show only a blinking Arduino. But in this case, as again, I use the same technology uh, as I've presented you so far that we use for Leo script. And if you are changing some kind of to the basically code, so those states of the editors uh, are synced. They can. This module sends the code uh, to or publish it uh, via an 
as a publish subscribe uh, mode topic. So if I click on to run, what will happen? This code is sent to the terminal. It gets compiled. And FTY ACM null is not found. Okay, so I screwed up on this. Wait a second. Okay. Oh, wait a second. I did not connect this. So it's not. <laughs> Connect uh, to find some use import. So for safety reasons, I simply run a the same in a Docker commands, but this is simply a, a Python server that shares the terminal uh, locally, so by a local host. And in the station mode, the station is aware of there should be uh, some service available and to which I can connect. And whatever I will receive from the local host, I will transmit this to the other peers that are uh, connected uh, uh, to my station within the classroom. So now everything works fine. Well, again, we are. The FTTY compilation uploading is working. Ah, uh, no. Okay, so for the fast, uh, demo, no, it's not open, probably, no, I just, wait a second, try something else. Okay, I cannot find at the moment my uh, local Arduino. Ah, well, I will show you something else. Uh, so in this case, this is the same module that I've loaded. If I go back to uh, let's close this one uh, because there's now this complex of carbon, uh, but this one uh, running uh, on one of Sebastian's uh, laptops, which actually I get to this complex of carbon also s starting, takes some time and everything works well. I should now connect to Freiberg or see the Freiberger station, and there's can you see this? So yep. I'm the only one attached, so and there's running some crosslip uh, 2004. I can control C this, let's change this to crosslip 2000 XX. Simply uh, rerun the code. And if everything works well, you see this, can you see this XX? That's changed. Well, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? So yeah, so this is basically the idea. If I I won't share this one with you, uh, because it's for the students and for testing and for for a single purpose. But this is just the idea of how we now try to create those uh, remote labs. Also, it's impossible to include this into Lia script, and in the future, we hope to to have those lab functionality also embedded into uh, Lia script. Lia script modules can be also loaded into this address stuff. But this is basically the idea and the technology uh, in behind is basically this uh, WebRTC uh, for direct communication and some CRDTs, and the other one is just like using plain browser-based technologies. So they are literally little to no uh, servers uh, 
added in the background to handle this. So if you have some kind of hardware setup, and we hope to share this, what is this? Uh, so yeah, I go back to my task. Uh, wait a second, I'll simply log out back to the lobby. Uh, there's this share opportunity, and we hope to have those free classroom lab configurations uh, within the future. So here's another one, there's another one, so that those laboratories can be shared like open source project, and that basically anyone can open, maybe if he or she has the same infrastructure, Arduinos, tiny robots or uh, chemical simulations or whatever he wants to share it, uh, he can use, he or she can use this or share this stuff with browser-based technologies, no server, it cannot go down, everyone, everything's for free and yeah, no login. So that's the basic idea of how we want to create laboratories in Firebase so far. Any questions? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the talk until here. Um, very interesting. <laughs> Always very interesting to see this. Um, are there any questions? There's one. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for the talk. Very interesting. Um, um, I have two questions actually. The first one was um, I mean, I, I didn't understand all the things that are going on in the background. So, what would be actually needed if I take my laptop and want to uh, like set this up, use this in some way? What would be like the process mm. to install this? Or... No, you don't have to install uh, anything. If you are um, just like, uh, if I want to share, if you mean this uh, laboratory or if you yeah, mean the, the script content. So, um, what I need. Encourage you to do probably is just like uh, for for the content education stuff. Script, uh, there's a live editor where I create a new node. Uh, world. So recompiling is in here, and uh, I can go probably also like uh, online. Via web sockets in this case. So if you're connecting uh, to this, we can collaborate, uh, share, same technology. Also, long UID is generated in here, who we can meet, uh, collaborate on creating one educational content and document. And everything that we are using basically is just like a browser based. So this editor is only a website that you can also install if you want to. And uh, that's it. It should actually run in nearly every modern browser. And the same is true for the lab. The same is true for the Lia script uh, presentation website and stuff like this. So everything is browser based. Does it? Yeah, answer uh, uh, yes, I think. And you are using VS Code to do that, right? So is there some. Oh, yes, yeah, there is an. Um, Plugin, so you can either install VS Code, where is it, uh, within your uh, uh, VS Code directly, and there are these uh, extensions. And if you search for the script, so the cross lab is not uh, included so far. So in the browser, you can use this web uh, preview web, uh, and on the desktop version, this original Lia script view. So and I did it just. To be fast, I can go back to. Wait a second. I don't commit my changes, but I can always go back to github.com. Com, com. So, which will load the project website, uh, no project website, the GitHub repository. And uh, if you are logged into GitHub, you can always uh, either hit on dot. Or simply change this .com to .dev, 
uh, to get into this uh, web editor mode, which is basically nearly the same, but with more restrictions uh, in this case. And then you can use this also to edit uh, your contents or whatever there is directly within the browser. Okay. Thank you. Ah, my other question. Um, 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 my other question is um, the I, not the uh, um, collaboration aspect and the thinking, but uh, just the uh, aspect of making um, like interactive documents reminded me a lot of uh, Jupyter and uh, Jupyter notebooks. Um, can you, yeah. is there, have you, are there reasons that you didn't use that for, for your application? I will start it with something that, uh, with Jupyter Notebook, if you read this in a text file, probably, uh, it's just a large JSON document, probably nested. And we wanted to have something that uh, can be edited with yeah, with a simple text editor, and we started actually quite easy. And so with Jupyter Notebook, uh, you can also think of it's just like code where you add some additional documentation, markdown or functionality uh, around it. With Lear Script, it's a, actually you can, if you go to the Lear Script course, so this is also an aspect uh, of the PVR, so the PVA, uh, WPWA. So these are my courses, they are stored. And if I go to scripting, where is it? Interactive code. Further examples, search, uh, which is better, just wait a second. Yeah, it's probably, so the idea is, so uh, this is a kind of a tiny script uh, that sends a value. This is a tiny script. Uh, they are connected to a, like an input field probably. And so the idea is that you can basically input scripts or codes uh, within a separated block and add some, yeah, and adds a documentation around it, but actually the code or coding is an uh, integral part uh, of this stuff. So you can, within your document, you can always, uh, by double clicking, uh, inspect the kind of code that was, uh, that actually resulted in this uh, uh, specific diagram visualization or whatsoever, and you can edit this. Probably if I'm quite true, serious, don't know if this works. So, and the idea is if you have some kind of data, a kind of visualization, stuff like this, you can always inspect this. And not that you can see only the median value, and you can inspect it if the calculation is uh, doing right, how does it actually work, and uh, uh, to have like a more interactive or higher understanding of the data or whatever uh, it's presented to you. So, yeah. And yeah. our stuff actually doesn't require any kind of server. I think like in Jupyter uh, Notebook, if I, without an internet connection, my course, I cannot close the internet, but I can go into, where is it, where is it, where is it? Network offline mode. So everything still works. If I've done some quizzes, uh, if I want to have this. So all the content is still there. So even if I'm offline, I can access all of my courses that I have loaded earlier. And the thing is, it also runs on uh, very, very uh, tiny and embedded or edge devices like Nokia phones or even on my screen book reader. So I can uh, read those content or courses. So this is something that's not possible with Jupyter Notebook, I guess. So you always need to have some kind of installation 
server or something in the background. Um, yeah, so, um, because you just said it is kind of tiny and it runs on almost all devices, um, I had the feeling during the process of what all the things you showed to us um, that I would need some like a lot of cache memory because all of this stuff is basically processed on my machine. Is it true or is it, is it really that small? It's in most cases it processed on your browser. That's right. Uh, but the thing is, if I uh, probably, so what you always deliver is some kind of, if you go to the document, oh, I'm still offline. Uh, yeah, totally. There is, so what you always send is basically uh, this document. And so if you share your content, probably, and with, you go to the layer script website uh, .com, you enter your course URL and you click on load the course uh, what it does it actually simply adds this URL of your content uh, as a or adds this URL as a URL parameter and the way as this thing is loaded it's not the entire document uh, is parsed again it's just like slide by slide it's just like uh, parses the header and there's this body, so with the uh, entire contents. And the body is not interesting at the moment. The body is only interesting whenever you click onto this. So this kind of incremental parsing. So only uh, this, whatever here in this section is defined, is only parsed if I click onto this. And so the script is run, and there. So it's not uh, that much of a calculation actually, if you want to. It's just like those tiny bits. Uh, like every slide is only parsed whenever you visit it, and only the code that that's executed. Compilation. Sorry. So it's kind of a just-in-time compilation. Yeah, the incremental uh, uh, just-in-time compiler. Yeah, that's correct. So if you you are still own your code, if I change this contents probably, and you reload my course. Your course and your browser also changes. So what the browser does, uh, probably checks the version. If the version is uh, below one, so it always uh, re, how to say, uh, reinterprets uh, the entire document and loads it. Otherwise, it just checks. Uh, oh, there has there has been some changes. Okay, uh, or there have no been changes in the version. So I uh, stick with the last version. And so you uh, load this stuff from memory, and it's already has been pre-processed and also already stored within your browser with cache, but it needs to be in this case. But as I can run Python code on this new this slide, I can share Python code and other people would run them on their machine, so I could theoretically hack them. No, uh, it's because everything runs in the browser. If you want to share or run Python code, so you can uh, use another implementation, or you use this, uh, how it's called, Pi, wait a second. Uh, Could I create a shutdown? Uh, no. Button like this, for example? Uh, no, you can just uh, run within the browser. So in this case, it's uh, actually a secure environment where you can, if you want to have some kind of Python code, I don't know where I have it at the moment. So it's actually, if you want to embed Python programming, uh, you either, in this case, you use a JavaScript uh, library that interprets Python, or we have a development server where your Python code snippet is sent to. The code is there executed, and the result is sent back to you. So, and when uh, whoever you send your uh, code, he's, he or she is not actually executing this Python uh, code. It's actually just a service that might look appear or might look to you as if you run this on your system. But it's basically just. If I have a JavaScript library that does the stuff, it's fine. It works directly within the browser. Otherwise, you have to use some kind of external service where you can send your code and get the results back and interact uh, simply via this script environment. And in the 
uh, where is it? Address light, station mode. I could probably, so it's still running. So, uh, so this runs in a secure Docker environment. I could do something like exit probably. And what has, has happened, it just closes the you know, say, Docker instance and reloads it. So the temporal folder has changed and I can just start it uh, again in this case. So, but there is a little trade-off in making it secure, but it's actually possible. So, and you cannot break out of this Docker container in this case, but yeah. So if we would like to set up a, a lab like this, we would need a laptop or any kind of PC that controls the Arduino and uh, the camera and provides the Docker container, basically hosts this website. So we no, you, uh, it doesn't host. It doesn't host. They say it's not a server application because it looks like a server application. <laughs> Yeah, it looks. Uh, the thing is, it just it's a, uh, it's a it's a website. There's no uh, backend actually that it does anything. So if I okay, if I run now this in station mode, uh, there is this when I started this Docker container. Uh, this is a uh, there is a tiny server. If I'm not using uh, a web serial, probably uh, there is a little server that uh, adds this connection from your local browser which runs in station mode uh, and it's expects so that there is some kind of functionality or service that i can actually access and uh, it talks like on local hosts so that's it so every browser is capable of talking to local hosts and so there's just one docker container that offers this uh, terminal browser or server in this case and this is just the communication between this station modes to the local host and everything else is replicated via this uh, p2p system web rtc to all others so and if they go to the same shell click onto this uh, this is basically why web rtc sent to all the others and also to the station mode and the station mode is not as aware of okay if the guy hits enter the others just visualize it. Probably I have to send this or to do something else with the code in this case. But it's just like uh, to run the Arduino. This is the only thing where you need to, uh, if you want to compile this, you need to run a terminal server locally. But all the stuff, all the other stuff is actually shared uh, or yeah, via peer to peer network. This is entirely browser based. Does it answer your question? Yeah, I think I'm still trying to figure out how to rebuild this because uh, I think this is a super interesting application for us. You can. Um, you actually, can. we are thinking about uh, building like a, a little measuring device and put, set it up on the rooftop to get some uh, yeah environmental data, and we would like to share it in a measuring lecture with students. Um, so your input is like really, really coming handy <laughs> at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very the much. link is within the slides and you can just either contact me or if you yeah. just want to start there's some kind of I click on this share so there are not much at the moment uh, lab configurations uh, basically just three uh, yeah you can probably start with this Pi X terminal and the other one I added to uh, this project uh, so yeah. So if you just load this configuration uh, in your class, or you create a new class, load this configuration, uh, whatever it is. So all the modules get loaded into your browser, and you can reconfigure them, or change the code, and whatever, and basically share this with your audience and stuff like this. So and the other ones, if they like this code, probably they either open their hardware or allow accessing uh, their hardware by clicking or opening their browser within this station mode. It's not classroom slash IDE, whatever, it's stations uh, slash uh, IDE. Uh, or you can simply always, if you like a course, probably so. This is a unique idea. 
you created some course or you're a student in some one course, you can always go to this fork stuff. So we clone the entire course and with some other modules and this is now new. So I'm now the owner. I can share this uh, when I change the hardware, the configuration with others. In this case, only by sharing this URL. And so, yeah, so that's basically the idea of creating free uh, shareable uh, ellipse. But the thing which you don't have at the moment is something like uh, security access and this has to implement it by your own because at the moment this is just like the unique key. Every, everyone who has access to this URL has probably the same rights. So mm -hmm. if you if you want to uh, has been used malicious uh, stuff like this, the only thing of what you can do is just simply create a new fork of your course and delete the other right. one. So, and it's just like deleting some content from my uh, local browser. So, yeah, so I, I think there will uh, be more questions when I actually try to set something like this up. But uh, I think to this point, and thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy if oh. you try to use it or something like this. Would be glad. Uh, would be happy. Yeah. Okay, I have maybe a last question, which is more personal. When I tried last time, near scripts like one and a half years ago, I had some trouble with the ASCII drawings. Can you just shortly comment on how they are interpreted or what, what's behind this, basically, how this is working? Uh, you mean those... something like this? Yes, yes exactly. Uh... <laughs> This, this seems quite magic, to be honest. Uh, yeah, of course, it's not currently added. So, blah, blah, blah. So, and I implemented, and um, where is it? Uh, um, packages. So, um, most of the cases, the stuff, the interpreter, the compiler is developed in Elm. So like a functional uh, language and, wait a second, uh, S okay. where is it? So it basically, uh, simply it's a detector. So I made a Elm library out of it. So we basically, it just checks for those, if it's a plus, if it's a minus, and tries to figure out if the next one above, below, uh, in front of this, is this a uh, space, or is this another dash, 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 so I can come up with a line. If it's a plus, and there are some dashes uh, above and below, they are probably, uh, they also have to be interconnected, and so that you can have these uh, different shapes, probably. So if you had stars, these are like uh, dots uh, and different areas and stuff like this. So it's basically a little Elm library, which just takes some kind of text and tries to figure out uh, which symbols can be reinterpreted uh, as a line and generates an uh, SVG image out of it. So just like and what you can also do is just like what has been tricky at the moment was you can use those uh, Unicode symbols, but these emojis, they are very tricky because an emoji, it has like, you see one symbol, but it might be a combination of different emojis uh, with color value, with something else. So uh, within the string representation, they have like five, six, seven, eight bytes or something like this, but uh, represent only one stuff. So this is something that I added lately. Even though, uh, life editor, where is it? So as you can see those lines and uh, what you can also do is by these 
quotes, double quotations. It actually tells, okay, this part within the quotation, this might be something Lia script syntax. So you embed Lia script into this ASCII art. And so in this case, like just like image, which is a macro, so that you can do have something like this. So a quiz, I don't know, with some more elaborate stuff or something like this. So it's just like everything is interconnected and the SVG stuff is just a, a Elm library that is a simple parser for uh, SVG images based on text. So in this case, but yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, really seems like really powerful and yeah, always impressive. Um, any other questions so far? There's another one. Um, what uh, I would be interested in, uh, what are your future plans with this project? Do you have any specific uh, goals that you are to working towards? Or... Uh, within, <laughs> uh, there are multiple actually. What, what would be great was actually to have uh, more people uh, um, to add to this project that start to create open educational resources. Uh, like OER and uh, host them for free, develop them for free, like in Teams, uh, because at the moment, just like if you get some uh, educational content for free, it's either a PDF, it's either a PowerPoint, it's a Word document, or it's a website or a video, but it's nothing that you can uh, uh, use or change or, yeah, uh, actually recombine in this case. So that we hope to with LeoScript that we somehow make a difference. And in the very not near far future, I'd like to, there have been some attempts uh, that uh, a, a researching colleague from Australia probably uh, thought uh, ChatGPT uh, to create not only text because the text with ChatGPT that you create is mostly Markdown, the, but uh, it thought it to create like uh, content with Lear script syntax. So this is just. Uh, like one idea, if you start to developing content, it would be great to have this uh, AI system which assists you, which generates or helps you generate in those steps for your content or explains this. And on the other part, I would, would like to have this as an uh, this AI assistant also as a as you've seen this within the chat. So as like this tutor who is aware of the entire contents, documents, stuff like this, and just like can regenerate all the time new examples if it's for math or tries to explain this in a textual way um, without any hesitation or without any problems again and again again depending on the, let's say, on your status if you're a sixth grader or a university student and stuff like this to have this uh, teacher like embedded into this. So this would be great. and. With the lab infrastructure, we hope that we actually in the future can manage it. That in other parts of the world, uh, they can access our laboratories. Uh, that we have something like an uh, open source yeah, movement uh, for labs uh, where students can access any kind of chemical simula and not simulations, but experiments that they are probably not possible within their uh, universities or that even teachers that only have one or two other units to share can do this like for the entire class 24 7 just without the need of installing or uh, hosting a server or paying something for it so just like to have yeah to make education like free and accessible and without any costs so this is just like the main goal that's maybe also a good closing word yeah, thank you. Good. So, thank you again for this very interesting talk, especially on this show, short notice here. Um, we will truly come back to you for any questions when we will be using the script. And yes, so this is the end of the seminar. And thank you. And see you next week.